Welcome to the Vet Dental Show. I'm Brett Beckman, board certified veterinary dentist, and we bring this podcast to you every Wednesday as a veterinarian, as a technician, as a dentistry team to help you be even better at veterinary dentistry in your practice. We're sponsored and partnered today with the Veterinary Dental Practitioner Program. If you're interested in being among the best anywhere in general practice as a team in veterinary dentistry, I invite you to request an invitation. Just go to ivdi.org slash inv, like invitation, first three letters, inv. So ivdi. International Veterinary Dentistry Institute, ivdi.org slash INV, and we'll get you the information that you need. We also had um, some really good questions regarding our nerve blocks, and so we're going to talk about um, uh, the nerve blocks, and I'll answer a lot of these questions as best I can um, with, uh, with what we've got going on here. And we really want to stress that nerve blocks, just like dental x-ray, are absolutely required for dentistry. Dr. Beckman has said over and over and over again, if nerve blocks went away and dental x-ray went away, I would never do um, another procedure. And so um, this is just for so many reasons to make sure that these patients are comfortable under anesthesia, so we can keep that anesthesia low, um, keep them light under anesthesia, and it lends itself to a really smooth recovery, as well as uh, the days following that procedure. And these patients go home comfortable, and that's critical in getting really good client compliance that these dogs go home and they eat, um, and these cats go home and they eat and they're comfortable, um, they're sleeping, they're not, you know, whining and, and just uh, a hot mess because they're painful. Um, so <clears throat> this question, any suggestions on how to get the docs to get on board with that? Hopefully all of those components um, will help in getting that across and establishing that as a standard of care. And when nerve blocks are done correctly, using the anatomy um, that we showed, get a little practice on a cadaver and get comfortable, um, we really don't have um, a lot of issues with placing those nerve blocks. So the risk is minimal and the benefit is huge. So we really want to try and get that across. And if, um, if your docs aren't comfortable doing it, um, if your techs aren't comfortable doing it, get to a live um, seminar, get to a live lab and get it done because that is, um, it's absolutely uh, needs to be part of the, the whole total protocol. Um, so courses that um, we would recommend. Um, <clears throat> we do um, a live tech course, tech extravaganza, and um, we cover nerve blocks and we work on those and that's one of those skills that you can learn in the lab on Saturday and implement in your practice on Monday. And that's how I teach and that's what I recommend, that you learn this skill, get comfortable with it, because it is they are relatively easy to do. They're much easier than what a lot of folks think. And once you do these on a cadaver, um, you can get really comfortable with them and, um, and just move forward and get those implemented into your practice. So um, that would be my recommendation. So hopefully you guys can get to, get to a live lab. And there's, um, there's other um, conferences around, but um, we, um, we cover those uh, in depth. So certainly that would be the biggest recommendation. When do you recommend the nerve block be administered closer to when the doctor is going to do the extractions or near the beginning of the dental? Um, good question, Jacqueline. Um, I actually will place the nerve block um, as soon as I'm done taking the x-rays because I can see obvious pathology on the x-ray 
and know that um, we're going to be doing you know extractions in this quadrant um, there's some bone loss in this quadrant maybe be doing some root planing so I'm going to place the blocks right after I take the x-rays and see uh, where we've got pathology and the sooner we do that the better um, those just take a few seconds to place and then we can move on with putting that estimate together putting the treatment plan together um, and even if that changes um, you know those are relatively inexpensive and um, so if I placed a block that we may not need um, which is rare that typically doesn't happen um, uh, then it's it's not an issue um, so we want to make sure that we're able to recognize pathology quickly obvious pathology and so that we can number one chart that start that dental chart and move that case forward and by knowing obvious pathology we know where to place those nerve blocks and we do those um, as uh, right that's my next step after taking dental x-rays good question all right <clears throat> Why are the pets on their back for giving the nerve blocks? Is sternal position just as effective? Um, well, logistically speaking, when I complete my x-rays, they're already on their back. That's how they are. And uh, so I'm not going to flip them again. I'm going to leave them on their back for the cleaning. And I have a video here. Um, there's a question regarding um, dorsal recumbency and the uh, benefits of that. Um, but they're on their back, that's, that's where they're at, so I don't need to uh, flip them again to put them in sternal recumbency. Um, logistically speaking, that's, that doesn't make sense, and um, I may have to reposition for oral surgery, but uh, very rarely um, they're going to go back into sternal for oral surgery. They're going to go on either one side or the other. But for that next step, um, remember I said I do my nerve blocks as the next step following taking x-rays. So I've completed my x-rays, they're on their back, that's when I place my nerve blocks. So I don't have to flip them again and then I start to start to clean with them on their back. And we'll talk about that in a, in a moment. Um, some questions here on the specific agents. And um, all good questions here from Rebecca, Julie, Amber, and Emily. Um, what is your opinion on ropivacaine? And ropivacaine is just as effective. Um, we had to use that for a short period of time because of the back order issue with bupivacaine. So absolutely um, okay to use that. And the, um, the action of that particular agent is very similar to bupivacaine question here about adding buprenorphine and or lidocaine to these blocks and yeah in in years past um, we thought two things that are no longer true number one we thought bupivacaine took um, somewhere up to 20 minutes for uh, to reach efficacy we're now finding that it's probably less than five minutes the other thing that we thought is that it only lasted six to eight hours. We're now finding that it lasts um, anywhere from 24 to 72 hours. And so the lidocaine was used for a quicker onset, which we don't need anymore because we know that bupivacaine is, is coming on board in, in less than five minutes. A narcotic was added, we did do that in years past, like hydromorphone or morphine or buprenorphine to lengthen the efficacy of that block, which we now know we don't need to do because it's lasting all by itself up to 24 to 72 hours. So a narcotic adding that to that block is no longer necessary as well. So based on the newer information, and there's studies that were done. You guys can find that on the on the net. Um, there's a lot of studies that were done that sh that show that um, they did um, brachial plexus uh, blocks, uh, a middle mental block to kind of test that that theory. And yeah, we're finding that they are uh, lasting much longer. 
<clears throat> so uh, we had a question regarding uh, dosing from uh, amber. How do we calculate that? And so um, when we uh, look at this, um, we are using our um, buprenorphine and we're um, calculating this by um, starting with one cc per 10 pounds. One cc per 10 pounds is the maximum volume that we would want to use. That's staying within that two migs per kg or not exceeding that two migs per kg. We would divide that by four and that will give us our volume per site because if we're going to anesthetize the entire oral cavity, we would use four sites. So we multiply that by the number of sites to be blocked. That tells us how much to draw up and administer. So for instance, if we have a 10 pound cat, we know that we can use a full CC. We divide that by four, and that gives us a quarter CC per site. We multiply that by, for instance, three sites that need to be blocked, and we know we need to draw up 0.75 and deliver a quarter CC per site. So if we have a 40 pound dog, we know that we can use a total volume of four cc's. That gives us a volume per site of one cc because we would divide that by four, okay? So a lot of folks are way underdosing when they do their bupivacaine. Now, where we have to be careful is when we have those micro dogs on our table because we don't want to deliver less than a quarter cc of volume because we got it we have to have enough volume to carry that agent where it needs to go and so i will calculate that still using that one cc per 10 pounds so if i have for instance a four pound maltese on my table i'm going to draw 0.4 of the agent dilute that out to a full cc with saline mix that really well, and then I can still deliver 0.25 to each site, it will be that volume, it's just at a lower concentration. But we've got to have the volume of liquid to carry that agent where it needs to go. So that's where we have to be really careful. It's hard to overdose a larger dog. It's those smaller breed dogs that we've got to use that calculation and just dilute it as needed um, based on that patient. What are the signs of bupivacaine overdose? Very, very good question. And bupivacaine um, is uh, cardiotoxic. So you will see things um, uh, sometimes up to and including um, asystole. So it is, uh, it is a cardiotoxic drug. Um, so you'll see changes in um, uh, EKG. Um, you may see arrhythmias um, all the way to coma and, uh, and death. Um, but using it at the dose that we recommend, and that's why we recommend um, to always, always aspirate before injecting so that we don't give it into a vessel. So if you have flash, you're going to stop, redirect, aspirate, and inject there to confirm that we are not giving it into a vessel. So it is cardiotoxic. Is there a risk of patients chewing their tongues when there might be uh, nerve blocks uh, present. Um, this is, you know, it doesn't happen as often as what a lot of folks think. I think it's sometimes a, you know, a urban legend in some cases. But what we have to remember, patients that um, are monitored until sternal will never ever have this issue. It's typically those patients that are too out of it and not monitored properly in recovery because when they're lateral that tongue can fall between those carnasal teeth and those are the teeth that will do the damage as they're waking up chewing their tongue. When they're sternal and somewhat with it that tongue kind of comes back to the center of the mouth and so it's out of the danger zone of being trapped between these carnasal teeth. And with our patients, specifically our dental patients, doing that lighter anesthesia, using those agents that metabolize quickly, 
our patients are sternal usually within one to three minutes of them coming off the table. They're standing usually within five to 10 minutes. And so we don't ever walk away from a patient that is completely lateral, completely out of it, but they're like that for a very short period of time. So we don't have a lot of downtime in between patients. And so if they're monitored properly, that is just not something that's, that's gonna happen. So we wanna monitor until they are um, somewhat sternal and then we don't run into that issue. I'm terrified of administering the blocks in the wrong place. What are the consequences if the block is not injected in the proper location? In most cases, if the block isn't in the right spot, you're gonna have um, pain during oral surgery. It's just not gonna anesthetize what it, needed, what it needs to anesthetize. That is the number one thing that happens where the patient is just gonna feel that oral surgery. So we know we need to repeat that block. Other consequences, um, the way that we teach our blocks, our nerve blocks, those techniques and that specific anatomy, the risks are, are very, very minimal. Um, we're nowhere near the eye. Um, we're not uh, near any large vessels. Um, there's really um, minimal risk as far as anything detrimental or life-threatening to the patient. It just doesn't happen. In most cases, it's because um, it's uh, if placed in the wrong spot, it just didn't do what it needed to do. It didn't bathe the nerves and did not create an effective um, analgesia in that, in that region. So we just need to uh, repeat the block. For somebody who's terrified, I would absolutely recommend getting to a live lab. Um, this is where we can support you and um, help you and give you that 100% um, yes, you're doing it right, or no, let's move this here, and we can work with you um, and get you at a comfortable spot where you're not terrified. Because yeah, that anything like that can be scary, um, but honestly, a lot of folks have um, kind of that, uh, what they've heard and um, already um, unfounded fear. And then once they do them and have that um, somebody knowledgeable helping them, uh, that fear is significantly reduced. Um, just because it's, it's based on um, a lot of things that they've heard that are a lot of urban legend. Um, I've been doing blocks for more than 20 years, and um, it is something that is not as scary and not as detrimental as a lot of folks think. So I would, I would recommend getting to a, a live lab. I hope you enjoyed that episode. If you'd like more information about the Veterinary Dental Practitioners Program, please submit to request an invitation at ivdi.org slash INV.